or the list price. You do not want to be the one. You want them to tell you because the second you write it in, they're going to go, when it doesn't sell, they're going to go, well, we wanted to sell it for lower and now Raymond didn't do it. Now we're going to talk to his E&O insurance. So you would tell them, hey, look, your house is somewhere between 245000 255000 Where would you like to start? And of course, they're all going to say two hundred and eighty. <laughs> no, 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 no. Maybe you didn't understand. Somewhere between two hundred and forty-five and two hundred and fifty-five. Where would you like to list the property? And they're going to go. I don't know. What do you think? And you say, Well, I think you should pick a number between two hundred and forty-five thousand and two hundred and fifty-five thousand. And they're going to go. Oh, okay. So what are we going to write in there? Well, we're going to write a number somewhere between two hundred and forty-five thousand and two hundred and fifty-five thousand. Do not be the one that says, yeah, let's go with 249.9 because the second it sells in one minute, they're going to go, well, you didn't charge enough. Or the second it doesn't sell at all, they're going to go, we want it to go lower. So make sure that when you get that range to them of 245 to 255 and they go, well, how about 254.9? And you go, that's a good number. I was thinking that myself. That's where the listing price comes from. Them, not you. There's a little bit, we talked about that, <clears throat> leased equipment. Here's one that I laugh at all the time. <clears throat> the proposed closing date. No. If you could guess the closing date when you are listing the property, you are the best agent in the world, and I would bow to you and let you have every client there is. You don't have the slightest clue when the closing date's going to be if you're listing the property today. It may never close, all right? So, no, you would put buyer's possession. This is where the seller is going to say, yeah, we'll give it to them the day we close. But on the purchase agreement is the proposed closing date. It's not on the listing agreement. I'm not sure who wrote that. But that's not right, all right? Um, all the evidence of closing, you know, is it a general warranty deed, special warranty deed? Uh, are there any, you know, encumbrances like liens? Oh, well, I've got a first lien and I still have to pay my taxes for this year. Oh, and by the way, there's an easement because of a shared driveway. Um, how long's the broker protection clause? Are there any warranties by the owner mean like are you buying a home warranty or maybe something in the house still has a warranty there is a, a identification wording and identification is the hold harmless meaning you can't blame me if you told me the roof was new i am not under obligation in any state in the united states that requires the real estate agent to have their own inspection before they list the property. We work under what is called actual knowledge. If the seller told me the roof is brand new, I write brand new roof on the listing, and then the buyer comes in and goes, dude, that roof is 30 years old. We had our home inspector, and you go, time out. That's exactly why you had that home inspection, to find that out. And two, I am not at fault because that's what the seller told me. There will be non-discriminatory wording about the Fair Housing Act. Uh, we will get into that. Um, there will be uh, antitrust wording, remember, like the group boycotting and the price fixing that says, hey, I'm not colluding with anybody to artificially increase this. Then you are going to get a signature of all the parties. How many names are on the up here at the top where we put the names? You better have that same number of signatures down here at the bottom, and it better be the same people, right? Even husbands and wives. The, uh, the husband cannot sell the property out from underneath the wife, nor vice versa. So if it's a tenants by the entirety, then both the husband and wife have to sign that listing to saying they're okaying with that. Okay, and then there's a date on there. So those are all the important things that would be on that listing contract. Now let's flip over and talk about if you're representing the buyer. 
there are many different buyer types that you could work under. The worst buyer type is that open buyer's agency, right? That is the implied agency that we talked about. That is the agency that is created by actions, meaning you did not get them to sign the legal document. And there is one called the exclusive buyer's agency, which says, I get paid no matter what, when you buy a home or if you buy a home. You should get buyers to sign this form that contractually binds them so that you are considered the procuring cause. And you want to be that procuring cause. Remember, procuring cause is the chain of events that ultimately results in the sale. I want to be the buyer's procuring cause. I'm the one that sent him the email. I'm the one that showed the house when he called me. I'm the one that wrote the offer for him. I'm the one that contacted the listing agent and said, hey, I've got an offer coming. I want to get paid and become the procuring cause. So I would have him sign the exclusive buyer's representation contract. If I fail to get him to sign that, I work under that open agreement, which says he can enter into as many as he wants. It's very similar to the listing open agreement that, the remember, the seller can enter into as many as he wants. The buyer can do the same thing. By lack of signing the exclusive buyer's agency, maybe we should do this a little bit. You've got this thing called the exclusive buyer's agency agreement. That is the contract you want the buyer to sign. The buyer can only sign one of them because it's exclusive agency. If I get him to sign that, I am in essence the procuring cause and I get paid no matter what. When he writes an offer to a house and he has me write it, I'm going to get paid because I'm the one that was the procuring cause. I sent him the email, I showed him the house, I did all of that. If I fail to get them to sign anything, you know, I trust this buyer. He's my brother's sister's neighbor's aunt's on the second cousin side. We know each other. I'm not going to ask him to sign a contract, but I am going to go show him houses. That is implied agency because it is based on the actions and the action of showing a house is what an agent would do. So you have created implied agency, but he's not signed the exclusive one. So now when he calls you and says, Raymond, can we go see that house? And you say, you know what? I've got a dentist appointment this afternoon. I can't really make it. Can we go tomorrow? And he's like, yeah, I'll call you tomorrow. Then he hangs up and calls you and says, can you go show me this house? And you go show him the house and he writes the offer and has you write it. You now become the procuring cause and I just got screwed. All right. I don't care if I have shown him 14.87 million homes for the last 38 weekends in a row. The one he wrote an offer on because he was under open which allows him to do as many as he wants, you now get to be the procuring cause on the one house he saw that he liked and the one house that he had you write an offer on, all right? So you've got to be careful when dealing with buyers that you do not get to sign this agency agreement because that means by definition they're working under an open agency and therefore, they can enter into as many as they want. And whoever took them to the house becomes the one of the procuring cause. All right? So that's how the buyers. And there's a whole bunch of questions that usually get asked. Uh, you know, one's if the buyer lies to the other agent. What happens if the buyer is under contract and still lies to the uh, buyer or to the agent? Oh my.
screen just locked up. Is that possible? Yes. He could sign a contract with me and still call you, and you being the professional go, are you working with another agent? And he goes, no, and lies. That can happen. That causes a little heartache and could present a problem down the road between you and I, because what's going to happen is I'm going to call him on Tuesday and go, hey, uh, my ten dentist appointment's over. I feel better. And he goes, well, you know, I really wanted to see that house yesterday. So I had uh, Billy Jean show me the house and uh, we wrote an offer. Well, dude, you signed a contract with me. And that contract says exclusive buyer agency. I get paid no matter what. I'm going to have to call Billy Jean and have a discussion with her. And you will get these calls. And it's not your fault. It's not my fault. It's the client who did not understand that he should have waited because he has an agency. Now, I get the whole point you're going to tell me. Well, if he waited, he may not have got it because the market's really hot or the market's really slow. That's still not the point. The point is he was supposed to have been educated by me to explain to him, I'm your only agent, and if I can't make it, I'll have one of my associates or assistants, or I'll call a team member, or I'll call another agent inside of my brokerage that'll help me out. You'll see that happen a lot inside of brokerages where you call your buddy and go, hey man, can you go show my client a house real quick? If he writes an offer, I'll give you $1,000 or I'll give you 500 or I'll do it, you do it for free. And then when this happens to you, I'll show your clients. So there are many ways around that, but you could still get the client lying and that could cause a problem when it comes down the road, okay? Um, I could get compensated and we've talked about this. Usually it's a percentage of the commission. Now, that percentage typically comes from the listing agent, all right? Now, I'm going to tell you that there are some potential lawsuits going on right now about this entire uh, issue of the buyer's agent being compensated. But I'm going to go ahead and teach this like the book wants you to know and the exam wants you to know. So let's go back over here and talk about that commission again. Remember, there was a commission that the listing agent charges. And if we go back to that example that we were on, or an example, it doesn't really matter. The listing agent says, hey, seller, I'm going to charge you 6% to list your house. But I am going to give away 50% of it to the selling agent. And who's the selling agent? Remember, they work for the buyer. I am going to give away 50% to the selling agent to entice him to bring a buyer to me or to you rather. So let's say the house that we had in that example was 200,000 and you listed it at 6%. And we did the math on this. Now there's a slight variation because what you're gonna see is the listing side keeps 3% and the selling side or the buyer gets 3%. This is what we call, and most of them call the BAC, the Buyer's Agent Commission. This is going to be disclosed in that MLS sheet. Remember I told you that when your buyer wants to look at properties, you go out and you get those three properties. Down here in the corner, in some places, in another state, it's up here. It's going to say something like, 3%. This is when that buyer knows, he now knows what he's going to make as the buyer's agent. All right. 
So the question that we dealt with earlier is, how much was the commission on this deal? Well, 6% of 200,000 is 12K, right? But 6K goes to the listing side. 6K, 3% or half of that, goes to the buying age or goes to the buyer side. This is where that buyer's agent would collect their money. And now this percentage, remember the example, first example is split 50-50 between you and me. So you end up with 3K, I end up with 3K. And what happens to this amount of money right here? I don't know. It goes to that other agent. It goes to the other agent. Remember, that's the managing broker. It would not go to Billy Jean in this example because they work for Carpenter or uh, Johnson and uh, what is it? Johnson and Stover down there in Florida. That 6,000 would go to Johnson and Stover and then Billy Jean would get paid from Johnson and Stover based on whatever split she had with her managing broker, all right? So this side is the buyer's agent commission. And this split, I really need another number, another color. This split here of 50-50, who decides that split? Me, as the listing agent, because it originally is my commission anyway. I could have split it 4% to me and 2%. I could have split it 2% to me and 4%. I could have split it 6% and 0%. That would be stupid, all right? So that split is decided by me. Most brokers, and when I say that word, I mean the managing brokers, most have an internal policy which try to split 50-50. Now, don't take that to the bank and don't bet your life on it. I'm just saying that's the most common. They usually split 50-50. But it can be split any way you want. And that decision would be based on... <laughs> should that work? The managing broker... That's based on the managing broker's decision, okay?